Hi, everyone. Good morning. Today, we're joined by Dr. Mark Breesacker, Chief Physician Executive here at Intermountain Healthcare to give our weekly COVID-19 update. Mark, it's nice to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, it's good to be here, Amanda. So as always, I'm going to start with case counts and go over what's been happening since the last time we spoke. Our total case counts in the state of Utah are at 369,433. Yesterday's daily case counts was 832, which brings our seven day percent positive to 12.4%. We've had a total of 1,890 deaths in the state of Utah and yesterday's daily rate was 11. Our hospitalizations for yesterday were at 221, which brings our ICU referral rate to 76.9%. We have also given out 660,444 vaccines as of yesterday as well. So let's start with that. It seems like our hospitalizations and case counts continue to keep declining. Uh, how are we doing? How are our caregivers doing? What is the mood like in the hospitals right now? Amanda, thanks for asking that question again. I, I, overall, people are doing uh, quite well. Uh, I think the you know, getting back to, to normal levels of patient care has allowed teams to uh, reconnect. Uh, they're thinking a lot and working a lot on what has worked well, what have we learned, what should we keep doing. And at the same time, we're, um, as demand for certain services changes, we're making those adjustments and uh, we have caregivers going back to the jobs that they were doing a year ago. So, so uh, they're, they're really doing well and uh, looking forward to continue to vaccinate, continue to have Im immunity against COVID-19 grow and uh, excited about what that means for them and for the broader community. It does seem like we are moving in the right direction and it's it's a very positive thing. So I'm excited about it too. And you mentioned vaccines. I know that vaccine distribution is a very big topic right now and we're gonna get into some specific questions. My first one for you on that is how is Intermountain supporting the vaccine distribution? What are our plans for it? You know, our, our plans are, are to be part of that coalition. You know, we, we've talked about this before. Um, I know there's gonna be more information shared about that next week. Uh, but we are, we're planning, we're preparing, uh, getting sites ready, de developing plans for making sure that we have the right caregivers to staff uh, each of the clinics. So uh, we'll be ready to go when our local health districts and the Utah Department of Health uh, give us a signal that it's time to, to get going. And the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has been circulating in the news a little bit more recently about going through approval processes, which would make it the third vaccine available here in the US. Is this vaccine safe and effective? Can you walk us through some of the key points of it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the bottom line answer is yes, it's safe and yes, it's effective. Uh, I think if you, when you look at the data that was submitted to the FDA, you, if you, you really have to focus on those things that are most important. So does it prevent the severe and critical disease? Does it prevent deaths? Uh, and the answer to those things is yes. Uh, it's 85% effective against severe and critical disease at 28 days. Uh, there are no hospitalizations at 28 days uh, in the vaccine group versus 29 hospitalizations that took place uh, among those receiving the placebo. And importantly, there have been no deaths in in anyone who received this vaccine compared to seven deaths in the placebo group. So um, I, I'm really excited that this uh, is being considered. Probably, I think even as we speak, um, the FDA is meeting and discussing this. And um, I think it's gonna be really great for uh, Utah overall because it is a simpler vaccine. It's only a single dose. It's stored more easily. And that gives us a lot of flexibility uh, to focus on delivering this uh, in an equitable way across the state. Have there been any side effects reported with this specific vaccine that maybe vary from the other two? Or are they all relatively the same? They're all relatively the same. So uh, about 50% of people who get, got the vaccine reported the typical mild side effects of, of arm soreness, uh, of, of fatigue, of muscle aches. Um, I think importantly, people wanna know about the severe adverse events and the, that rate of a severe or adverse event was 0.4%. Uh, 
in the vaccine group. Interestingly, it was also 0.4% in the placebo group. So again, bottom line, uh, this, this vaccine has a very similar side effect profile to the first two vaccines that were approved uh, under the emergency use authorization. And what about the variants that have been popping up? Has this vaccine been tested more with those variants at all? And do you have any concerns with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine related to that? You know, I, I, have, I don't have, I think my concerns uh, are grounded in more general concerns, not specific to any particular vaccine. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the studies that took place for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine took place in many countries, including countries that have emerging variants like South Africa. They did report different levels of effectiveness in different countries. Um, my high level concern is that, um, you know, this really is a race between how quickly we vaccinate and how, and because when we vaccinate, we then decrease the level of vaccine, uh, vaccine, I'm sorry, of, of virus activity in the community. And that decreases the chances for a variant to emerge. One encouraging point related to this, when you look at California, they have had a, a significant portion of their most recent surge was due to one of the emerging variants. And yet they are seeing the same decrease in cases and hospitalizations as any other state. That's a reassuring point. Uh, I think everyone should know we're, we're watching this very carefully. The Department of Health is watching it carefully. The CDC is watching it carefully. And uh, we'll, we'll all be learning together. Uh, but for now, let's just keep vaccinating as quickly as we can. And as more vaccines become available, are people going to have the option on which vaccine they choose? And should they actually really be concerned with which vaccine they're actually taking when it becomes their chance to do so? You know, I think if I think to the future, broadly down the line, um, I, I, we will be in a situation where this vaccine is like any other vaccine. So whether, you know, just like you get a diphtheria, tetanus and whooping cough vaccine boosters, um, that, you know, we'll have the availability of multiple vaccines. Uh, I think the bottom line message here though is, you know, when you're eligible, go to a place that, that works best for you and get the vaccine. And um, not don't you know? Don't worry about which which manufacturer it is, because in the end, they're all very effective at preventing the most severe disease. I think one thing that's important to note on that is the state opened up eligibility to 16 and 17 year olds, which previously it was 18 and above. And the only vaccine that's approved for them is Pfizer. So if you have someone who does qualify for the, the 16 and 17 year olds medical conditions, just make sure wherever you're going has the Pfizer vaccine. I'm sure it'll be pretty specific, but I think that's the only nuance that it should really matter currently, right? That's, that's correct. And I know local health districts and the Department of Health are making sure that that, is, that information is really clear. And the other thing that I see them doing, which I think is really great, is just making sure that within any given county, there are multiple sites where both Pfizer and the other uh, vaccines are available. Uh, we'll be able to, to get you to the right place to get the right shot. And how do I actually find out if I'm meeting those eligibility requirements right now? Is there a good resource for me to go to to do that? Yes, the best place to go is to the Utah Department of Health website. They update their eligibility. Um, you know, you have to click on the vaccine link when, uh, uh, from the homepage. And it's very, very straightforward to get down to who is eligible and even click on a further link at that point to, um, to look at the specific conditions. And we'll and link maybe, that out. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah and I was, you know, I, I have to also add that it's, if you have any questions, call, call your, your primary care physician. Uh, and I, I know they'll help, uh, you know, your primary care physician or nurse practitioner or physician assistant can help you um, determine if you're eligible or not. That's a, that's a great point. I think your, your primary care doctor, especially if you do have that serious medical condition, can definitely point you in the right direction. And we'll make sure to put that link that you were just mentioning into the Facebook Live afterwards for people to look at. So lots happening in the vaccine world, and it seems like we're moving in a really great direction. 
What's crazy to me is that it's it's pretty much been a year since we had kind of patient zero in Utah. I remember this weekend pretty specifically because I wasn't here uh, and I, I kept hearing about what was happening in the US and then Utah. So it's been nearly a year. What's your assessment on how we've been doing about getting the vaccine out into the community? So I, I, we're doing a really good job. I, I think the the, the number I like to watch is just what percentage of all vaccine have we received as in Utah been administered and we're at 84% as of this morning when I when I did the math from the from the web page so I really you get really have to tip your hat to our public health officials and state leaders who who developed this plan to rapidly vaccinate um, Utahns starting starting uh, with those uh, from an age perspective and now adding those with uh, significant chronic medical conditions that puts them at increased risk for severe disease. I also think, Amanda, that uh, it, it has been a year. It's actually, you know, uh, it was February 28th of 2020. It was a Friday evening when we met as a team and had our first incident command call, uh, all focused on preparing to accept that first patient uh, in Utah. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I have to really just tip my hat to everyone that has made such significant contributions, uh, healthcare workers, um, business leaders, state leaders, community leaders. Um, it's, it's been a tough, challenging year. And, um, and yet we find ourselves in a really great place where there's a lot of optimism about the future. And in everything that has happened over the last year, what are things that you think we could keep doing in the future once COVID-19 is no longer really a problem for us? Is there anything that we've learned or taken from this year that we'll keep going forward with for the years to come? I'd say the number one thing we've learned and I hope for most of us, it's always more of a reminder is that working together uh, in times of, of significant need uh, across our community, that's what has always been the thing that, we, that has taken place in Utah. It's what we've done in many, many events, both events like this one, and even thinking back to when we hosted the Olympics, how everyone came together to, to really create the, the best possible results and outcomes and experiences that uh, each situation affords. So that's that's the number one thing that I know we will all take forward. I think from a health perspective, I'll, I'll go back to just uh, you know what our grandmothers told us, which is wash your hands. You know, hand hygiene is by far the easiest and most compelling thing for us to continue to do going forward. How can we make hand hygiene easier in public, uh, in schools? Um, you know, I think there's a, there's been um, a lot of uh, infrastructure and new options put into place. Let's keep doing that. I mean, it's, it's just, it just helps for so many types of conditions. And, um, you know, we should have thoughtful conversations about during next season's flu, next year's flu season, and whatever coronavirus brings us come the fall and winter, uh, that we're prepared to do the things like masking and uh, limiting exposure to a lot of indoor air with a lot of people. So let's let's keep those things in mind and keep using them going forward. I think I've mentioned this this to you before, but I will definitely always have hand sanitizer in my car <laughs> from now on. It just it feels a little bit more reassuring, and I I haven't gotten sick this year, so it's it's been great that these public health measures are actually working. I have a few more questions for you about the vaccines, and then we'll move on from there. Are you do you have any concerns um, with sixteen and seventeen year olds receiving the vaccine? beyond the fact that they need to get the correct product? Uh, I do not. Um, in fact, the, the American Academy of Pediatrics just published a, a, an article, a study on uh, the impact of the a virus w w amongst children uh, of people of color. And uh, not surprisingly, the impact is as significant as we have seen in adults. So. Uh, for all children, uh, we know the vaccine is safe and effective, uh, and I, I, I just don't have any concerns. I think it's super important that 
that they become vaccinated, especially those who have some of the medical conditions that are on the list. So, um, you know, if you're in active treatment for cancer, or if you have a chronic liver disease, you know, kids get chronic liver disease for other reasons than adults do, I, uh, but it's still super important because the, the medical effect of, the, of chronic liver disease is, is the same. And so no concerns at all, please, please, um, with, with your kids who have those conditions, uh, reach out and get them started on their series. On the flip side of that, do you have any sort of message for people in general who are worried about the vaccine and might actually decide not to get it? And with that, why is widespread vaccination so important right now, especially to get through the end of this pandemic? You know, it, it's such a personal decision. And I think I start with that. Um, the decision to get vaccinated is yours. Um, Doing so, look, it protects you, it protects those that you love and everyone else who you come in contact through, uh, you know, through your, your, your friend circles, your family circles, your, your work circles. Um, I just think, I, you know, I think this is such an important step for us getting back to the things that we love to do together. You know, going to the park. I, I was just sharing the other day how I, I just love, uh, Liberty Park in, in a, on, a, on a spring Saturday afternoon where the city is coming together to do all sorts of things, to walk and to jog and, and to picnic and to play a little bit of tennis there. And that, those are the things that we get to uh, get back to. Um, concerts outside, uh, Utah jazz games where, where the stadium is more, more full, college football games. Uh, so I just think, uh, I think it, I guess the bottom line me message is it does give you peace of mind. And so um, please think about it. It is your decision. Continue to be curious, continue to ask questions and learn about it. And I just encourage everyone to go ahead and, and make that decision for themselves and for everyone they love. That's some great advice. And I think bringing in whatever you love to do and thinking about how the vaccine can kind of help you get back to that is, is a great perspective and a great way to think of it. I know I'm, I'm very excited to be able to not feel uncomfortable hanging out with friends again. So I'm excited about the future. So there's been this mention of a fourth surge happening and I wanted to know if you are concerned about that at all. You know, I, my concern really is just based on it's the fact that it's important for us to be ready for anything that comes. I, I think we can feel pretty certain about the fact if you look at the data today, the facts that we have, we're, we're in a good spot. You know, cases are down, hospitalizations are down, ICU pressure is down due to COVID-19. And we're, we're, we're in this position of, of significant improvement. It's mostly due to the fact that so many are taking those public health measures. And we're beginning to have, an, the vaccines themselves are beginning to have an impact. Um, we'll be ready for a fourth surge if it occurs. Um, I think we as a community have to be ready to res rapidly respond with the things that we know make a difference. For example, we know that the additional um, um, orders that took place in late November when we were beginning to surge made a difference uh, around that Thanksgiving time. And then of course we see the response uh, with, within the data from the continued efforts of people in the community. So. My concern is, is really just rooted in that. Uh, and I think it's important for everyone in Utah to know that we'll be ready if that occurs. And I think I know that we know how to respond to it. There's this talk of this, uh, the word term herd immunity, and it's been talked about a lot. And I wanted to know how close are we actually um, to achieving herd immunity, specifically just in the state of Utah? Well, um, this is, this is a, a bit of a complicated question because it, it really is um, based on a combination of facts and assumptions. So what are the facts? We know that 180,000 Utahns have had uh, COVID-19 over the past 90 days. We know that 750,000 have been vaccinated. You know, those two numbers alone gets you to about 30% of the population. That's, that's a really great place to be in. You can make some additional assumptions around, you know, for every, 
for every person who was uh, symptomatic and diagnosed, there's probably a certain number of people who also became symptomatic but were never diagnosed. I'd say, you know, today, with a combination of both facts and some assumptions, we're probably between 40 and 50 percent immune. Um, and uh, I could see that growing to 50 to 60 percent by April, May, and above 70 percent by June, July. Uh, I think this this is uh, you know. Uh, well, first of all, I would I just uh, remind everyone again that there's so many assumptions here. The key assumption being that the vaccines remain effective uh, as well, and uh, previous infection remains protective against uh, the rising variants. Um, but I, but overall, I think that's why we and state leaders and many others in healthcare, certainly my peers in the other health systems are optimistic about where, we're, where we are today. And I think it's important to keep in mind that those numbers will only increase if people actually go get the vaccine. So it just kind of reiterates that the vaccine is super important for this. And if people are hesitant or deciding not to get it for one reason or another, it could potentially slow that down. Is that right? That's correct. And that is another key assumption. And with that as well, I know we've asked this question before, but I think it's important. Are people going to still need to wear a mask and kind of practice practice those uh, public health measures after they get vaccine, the vaccine itself? Well, I think, you know, when I was talking about peace of mind um, and getting back to the things we love to do, you know, part of that is being able to gather in larger groups. And so as the as our immunity grows, um, we will be getting to a point where we can and will relax those restrictions on public gatherings. And I think, I think wearing a mask will become um, uh, kind of a less, less important uh, in, the future, in the future. But I think the message today is let's hang in there. Um, we are not at a place where uh, the, the immunity across our different communities is protective enough for us not to be washing hands and not to be wearing a mask and not to be adhering to that, the social distancing and gathering uh, recommendations from public health. So um, bottom line is in the future, as we can see today, yes, I see that as being possible, um, but for now let's hang in there, stick with it because uh, it's making a difference. Last question for you is kind of going back to this reflection on a year ago. Can you talk to us a little bit more about your personal experience in those first couple of days when you started to tackle the pandemic? And if you could go back in time from what you know now, is there anything you would change or say to yourself to kind of change the trajectory of what's been happening? Well, you know, um, from a personal experience, uh, I would just say that we're all gonna look back on this year and uh, think of it as some of the most challenging of times and some of the most rewarding at times when we think about the, thing, the things I talked about before, the working together, the coming together as a community to, to uh, you know, make masks and shields, sharing those, those resources Across uh, across health systems and across different cities and counties, learning together, making you know making uh, decisions rapidly, a lot of right decisions, some some decisions that I think we would we would do differently, uh, understanding when we could have acted sooner, understanding when we overreacted, and um, I think that it's incumbent upon us to have that conversation. Um, we will have health challenges in the future. We will have a significant earthquake in the future. And so it's really uh, imperative that we codify and learn and document all these things that we did so that we uh, have great plans for whatever happens in the future. I, on a personal note, I would just say that it's, it's really been tough uh, a tough year for everyone. And each of us have had our own path, uh, our own experiences. 
I think the thing we share in common is that we've all experienced loss in, in one form or the other. This, this is something that we should keep talking about as a community. Um, talk about it with your family, talk with friends, support each other, reach out. Um, you know, this, this, uh, there, there's a time for rugged individualism and there's a time to reach out and ask for help. Um, and we should keep doing that. And that, that's one of the lessons that we should take forward from, from this pandemic. I think that's a really a great lesson. I think, uh, I mean, in the future, people will be learning about the COVID-19 pandemic and kind of what we've learned, which will be really interesting, but it's not just going to disappear. So I think your message of kind of talking about it with people and making sure that you're okay uh, is, is great, great advice for the future. Mark, is there anything else you wanted to mention to us today about vaccines or how you're feeling about uh, kind of what's been going on since the last time we spoke? You know, you know, I think um, I would just leave with a final thought of just continued gratitude for um, my colleagues in, in healthcare, for all the caregivers at Intermountain, uh, and for for the way that we continue to work together uh, with the business community, with state leaders, um, learning, uh, adjusting, pivoting, acting, acting to make a difference. Um, it's, it's such a reflection of who we are as a state, and um, it's, it's really good to be in this moment. So thank you, Amanda. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mark. I really appreciate the candid conversation. And if anyone watching has any questions about COVID-19 vaccine distribution, like we mentioned, you can go to the Utah Department of Health's website and see where clinics and vaccines are available near you. We also have our testing still happening. If you'd like to get tested, you can go to intermountain.com slash COVID testing, and you'll be able to fill out a quick survey and then pick an appointment arrival time for that. We also have an emotional health relief hotline, which is a great resource if you need someone to talk to. That is a free service that you can call at 833-442-2211. It's open seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Mark, thanks so much again for joining us, and we'll talk to you next time.